Good evening and welcome to the lecture, Our Amazing Universe. Before we get started, just a few notes. This session is being recorded. Throughout the presentation, please use the Q&A function found at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. We will answer as many of those as we can with the time we have left after the presentation. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Professor Joe Del Santo. Joe Del Santo has been fascinated by our amazing universe nearly his entire life. He has spent countless hours observing and studying it with numerous telescopes, which has only deepened his appreciation for it. This moved him to complete his graduate degree in astronomy while employed as a corporate project manager and trans transition careers into teaching astronomy at the college level in 2007. He's been sharing his love for astronomy with students and the public here at College of DuPage since 2012. Please welcome Professor Del Santo. Thank you, Julie. And good evening, everyone. It is a pleasure to have you with us tonight. Even though we can't be in person, we have much to discuss about our amazing universe. You know, our amazing universe is a really big topic maybe the biggest, and there's so much we could talk about. And unfortunately, we only have limited amount of time. So I decided I needed to obviously limit our discussion to just a few questions here, as you can see. Number one, we'll begin with what we've learned about the universe in recent centuries. We'll talk about how big is the universe and then move on to how did the universe begin? And then we'll finish up with two very important parts of the universe, dark matter and dark energy. So again, many other things we could talk about and maybe we'll get into a few of those in our questions. Let's go back and begin all the way with the ancient Greeks. They thought of the earth as the center of everything and didn't think of the universe as much bigger than our current solar system. Even by the Middle Ages, Nicholas Copernicus put the sun at the center of the universe, but again, wasn't too much larger than our solar system. It really wasn't until the 18th century that uh, what were then known as natural philosophers began to think more seriously about the stars and the rest of the universe. Thomas Wright, you see here, came up with an original theory of the universe. And in looking up at that faint band of light, the Milky Way, he thought it was a vast flat layer of stars. By now, telescopes had been invented and we did have some idea of the Milky Way. William Herschel, one of my favorite astronomers, he always seems to be part of my presentations, he gave us our first observational model. He literally went out and very carefully counted stars in different regions in order to get a better idea of the Milky Way. And you can see his model there in the lower left, about 6,400 light years in size, 1,300 light years in depth, with us approximately in the middle. Well, that's where things stood as we moved into the 19th century and into even the early 20th century. And at that point in time, two astronomers you see here in the lower left, Harlow Shapley, Heber Curtis, engaged in what was later called the Great Debate, although it really wasn't much of a debate. It was more two professional papers being presented at a meeting. And the point was to answer this question, was the Milky Way the only galaxy in the universe or could it be possible that what were then called spiral nebulae, as you see in the upper right, were other galaxies? Some felt they might be, some felt they were much smaller and much closer to us within the Milky Way. How could we determine this? Well, we needed to know the distances of these objects to know their sizes. And so you can see in the center, another important figure, Edwin Hubble at the telescope. Hubble was the one to settle this debate by measuring their distances and therefore their sizes. How did he do that? Let's take a minute and discuss that and see exactly. In the upper left, you can see one of the photos he took of what was then called the Andromeda Nebula. And if you look closely, he's marked a few stars individually with N for Nova. But you notice at the very top, right, he marked one VAR or variable. This was exciting because this was what he was looking for. Hubble used a technique pioneered by other astronomers to measure the variation of a star's brightness, known as a Cepheid variable. That variation period told him the actual luminosity of the star. 
the amount of light it gives off, and using that and its apparent brightness as seen from Earth, Hubble could determine the distance. Rather than being nearby us, he found that the galaxy was somewhere on the order of a, not quite a million light years away, obviously far outside of our Milky Way, obviously another galaxy. Later, we've, we improved our value to over 2 million, but the point was Hubble did know it. He did know at that moment forward that there were other galaxies outside our Milky Way. You can see the large telescope he used down there in the lower right. Well, this was a huge discovery. At last, astronomers had some observational evidence of other galaxies, and they went on from there. Hubble, in particular, measured 18 more galaxy distances. But he did something in addition to that that was very important as well. Again, other astronomers had pioneered a technique where they would take the light from such a galaxy, break it into a spectrum, and they could look at the spectral lines of that galaxy and determine if it had a certain motion either towards or away from us. This is known as the Doppler effect. Well, Hubble also made it a point to check that. As you notice down here in our lower left diagram, if we normally would see a spectrum with certain spectral lines, if the galaxy again was moving towards or away from us, let's choose away, those spectral lines would be shifted to the right or to the red. You should see here as an example, 5%, let's say. Well, this would tell them it had a certain velocity moving away from us. Hubble was rather startled by the fact that all except one of his galaxies were moving away. So he decided to plot out the redshift or the velocity against the distance. And you see his first early diagram here in the upper right, he noticed a straight line. Now when scientists plot things out and they get a straight line, we get rather interested, very excited. We assume there is a correlation here, sometimes even a law at work. So this was the first early evidence and we've since long since improved on that, of course, of just that, a correlation, a law dealing with, again, the velocity and the distance of galaxies. Here is an updated version of his graph. We've extended it outward farther. And notice what Hubble then did in, in, in the succeeding years was to establish this new number called H sub zero. You see at the top right here in red. This became known as the Hubble constant. And basically, it's a measurement of the velocity and distance ratio. Well. What this really was telling him, as it says, is the more distant a galaxy, the greater its velocity, and vice versa. You could turn that around and say, well, the greater the velocity, the more distant the galaxy. So you can see how useful this would be. The redshift, or the velocity, tells us the distance. All we really have to do is turn that equation around, as you see at the bottom there in blue, if we know h sub zero, which we did from his early measurements and subsequent ones, once we've calibrated that number, then all we really need to do is measure the velocity to determine the distance of the galaxies. So this became a very powerful technique during the 20th century. Astronomers would routinely measure redshifts, calculate the velocity, and using this relationship you see here, this nice straight line of Hubble's law, they would be able to determine the distance of the galaxies. Well, it became apparent very quickly that nearly all galaxies were moving away from us. And if you stop for a moment and think about what that really means, it means the universe was expanding. Place yourself in another galaxy. Perhaps you'd see the same thing as we do in the Milky Way, wouldn't you? In other words, motion between the galaxies is all relative. There is no arbitrary standard. But the point is, wherever you are, you would see galaxies moving away from you in three dimensions. This meant the universe was expanding. So an equal, if not greater, discovery of Hubble's was, again, the expansion of our universe. Well, as so often happens in science, of course, one discovery leads to the next. And then more questions arise. So at first, of course, astronomers quickly realized the expansion rate was uniform or the same in every direction. But here's an important point for us. 
it became apparent that galaxies were not rushing out into infinite empty space. Rather, a much more correct way to view this would be that space itself is expanding. Now this diagram is a bit misleading. It's very difficult to draw the universe because we cannot get outside of the universe. So I have to apologize for our limitations. I've yet to find a really good one to show you the entire universe while we're stuck on the inside of it. But I think you get the idea here. The idea being that space and time themselves are expanding, carrying the galaxies with. Sometimes it's described as the stretching of space. But the point being that, again, it's not that there's infinite space, but rather space is expanding and thus the universe is expanding. Well, you notice here as you're moving from left to right, of course, universal expansion. Notice, of course, on the left, a bright region where we would assume that would be the beginning of our universe. So astronomers quickly went to that question and did exactly that. We said, well, what if we essentially wound the expansion backwards? Could we determine when it began? Well, in fact, we could, knowing the rate of expansion. We simply would take essentially the inverse of h sub zero, one over h sub zero, to get the expansion time or age of the universe. Notice here that time is distance over velocity, whereas h sub zero was velocity over distance. Well, during the 20th century, we constrained this number there were some uncertainties in our measurements. And for many years, we could only pin it down to a, a rough estimate of perhaps between 10 to 20 billion years. But in the late 1980s, early 1990s, using the Hubble Space Telescope, an astronomer named Wendy Friedman led an international team to make the most precise measurements yet and give us our best estimate yet of the age of the universe, which you see here, 13.7 billion years old. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's a pretty profound number that we can actually measure the expansion of the universe and essentially wind it backwards and determine when it began, that it had a definite beginning. We take that for granted, but many ancient cultures assume that the universe was infinitely old. It was always in existence. Now we know that there was a beginning. Well, of course, as Hubble and other astronomers were looking out at the various galaxies, they were looking out farther and farther into space. And it's important for us to remember that light takes time to travel through space. In other words, if they were to look at a galaxy, say, let's just say 10 million light years away, well, the light took 10 million years to get here. So essentially, we were not seeing the galaxy as it truly is at this moment. We were seeing it as it was 10 million years ago. Other galaxies might be 100 million, 400 million, 800 million light years away. We essentially were looking into the past, weren't we? And the farther out we look, the farther back in time we look. Sometimes astronomers call this look back time. So this became a very interesting concept. We might think it's a disadvantage. We can't see what's happening at this moment, but actually, as so often happens, we can turn it into a positive thing and use that to our advantage. Think, for example, of paleontologists digging in the earth. Of course, the deeper they dig, the farther back in time they go, and they can piece together a history of earth. And so it is with the universe. Astronomers have long since turned to, again, looking farther and farther and looking farther back in time into the early universe. You see our diagram here illustrating that. Hubble Space Telescope on the left, looking out some distance Perhaps you've heard of the Hubble Deep Field image when uh, back in the 1990s, we tried to see as far as possible. Then some years later, the Ultra, Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Could we look back farthest to the beginning of the universe? How far could we look? Well, that is partly, partly constrained by our technology, but not entirely. In other words, it really also could turn that equation around, that question, and not just ask how far can we look, but really how big is the universe? That's another way to, I guess, phrase the question, wouldn't you think? So as we're going to see, that's exactly what astronomers have been doing. And I wanna take a few minutes now and share with you, how big is the universe? How am I gonna do that in a lecture here? 
Well, I want to do it this way, actually. This seemed to work pretty well. First, I want to start out with a scale model. You can see me here in my home, and I have a scale model of the Milky Way galaxy. My daughter made this for me. I told her I needed a Milky Way galaxy one foot in diameter for a scale model, and she did a beautiful job. She's an art teacher, and I'm very proud of my Milky Way. So we're going to use that as our scale. You probably know that the Milky Way is 100,000 light years in diameter. So there I am holding it in my hands. One foot equals 100,000 light years. Let's zoom out and look at some of the nearby galaxies. Now the Andromeda galaxy that Hubble observed, you can see, would be 25 feet away because it's 2.5 million light years away. So that may be, I don't know, the length of your home or the length of your driveway or something. If you can envision a one foot Milky Way, 25 feet away is the next big galaxy. You can also see in our diagram here some of the other galaxies in what is called the local group, our little corner of the universe. Well, let's take a big step backwards now. Some of you may be familiar with what's known as the Virgo cluster of galaxies. It's the nearest large group, whereas our local group only has a few dozen galaxies. The Virgo cluster has thousands. The center of the Virgo cluster is about 50 million light years away. So that puts us now in our scale model about 500 feet. Some ways down your sidewalk, maybe down to the neighbor's home or something out into your backyard. So hopefully that gives you some sense of how far away those galaxies would be. And you can see there are other smaller clusters of galaxies as well in our immediate region. Well, let's take another step backwards. Now we step back and we realize that that Virgo cluster anchors the Virgo super cluster, a large conglomeration of clusters. And there are other super clusters. This diagram takes us out to about 500 million light years. On our scale model, that would be about 5,000 feet or not quite a mile. So imagine if you hop in your car and drive that first mile, how far that would be start to get the sense in three dimensions how big this is becoming, isn't it? And again, 500 million years of distance also relates to 500 million years of time that we're viewing into the past here. Let's take one more step. Perhaps you've heard of quasars. Quasars are some of the most distant galaxies we can observe. They were much farther out several billion light years. Let's go out to five billion here at our limit. And the idea, once again, the farther out we look, the farther back in time we see, these were galaxies early in the universe. We learned that the universe is about 13.7 billion years old. Well, some of these quasars are halfway or more of that amount of time. So these are very early galaxies in our universe that we can examine. Well, I think by now you can see the universe is really big. Before I go any further though, I do want to do this. I want to take just a moment and show you a brief video clip. Now I want to first of all emphasize this is not an animation. This is going to show you actual galaxies as they actually are. This was done by a group of astronomers using the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is one of our biggest and most mature surveys of the universe. I had the pleasure of working with one of these gentlemen, Mark Subaru at Adler Planetarium, and this is the real thing. We're going to start out at Earth here and zoom out through the Virgo cluster of galaxies, and then we'll continue on to get a sense of when astronomers talk about millions and millions of galaxies, this is what we mean. It is quite humbling, quite mind-boggling, quite moving, really, to see this type of thing, when you imagine that each of those galaxies may have billions of stars, and there may well be billions of galaxies in our universe. It is just mind-boggling and, again, a little bit humbling for us to realize. As we zoom around a bit, couldn't possibly do this in reality, but notice that at first it may seem that galaxies are randomly strewn about, but actually they're not. You begin to get a sense that they are sometimes Again, congregated in clusters, you see when they're on the right. 
Other times we pass through a region that's somewhat sparse with galaxies, and we'll just touch on that a little bit more later. But this is how the structure of the galaxy is. Essentially, gravity has gathered galaxies into clusters. It has gathered clusters into superclusters. So kind of a hierarchy of structure in our universe. So I hope you enjoyed our little flight. Quite, again, mind-boggling to consider how many galaxies there may be. Let's go back and finish up our question, how big is the universe? We've seen, of course, galaxies can be millions and billions of light years away. How far can we see? Well, to answer that question, I need to introduce you to this interesting looking figure. This is a picture of what's called the cosmic microwave background. We're going to discuss this a bit more tonight. This essentially is a picture of the farthest light we can see. Let me tell you that immediately. But why does it look like it looks? Well, think about when we try to make a map of the spherical Earth on a flat sheet. Of course, there's distortion. And that's what we're seeing here. We're essentially seeing the entire sky. But we've had to, again, bring it down onto a way that we can put it onto a flat surface. So picture now taking the right edge of this image, the left edge, and wrapping them around behind your head. Now take the top and the bottom and wrap them under your feet and around your head so that this picture now becomes more of a spherical image that you're looking up at from the inside. Again, it's, it's kind of just the way we've chosen to project it. Okay, later on we'll come back and talk a little bit more about the colors. For now, I just want to emphasize that this is a picture of the entire sky and it is the farthest we can see. This light has traveled 13.7 billion light years over the age of the universe, which we said has been in existence for 13.7 billion years. Now, it's not quite exactly that much, but it's pretty darn close. So in other words, this is the farthest light we're ever going to be able to see, and I'll explain why in a few minutes. So again, the question you see here, does this mean the universe is 13.7 billion light years in radius. That would seem logical. That's how big it is. That's how far we can see if we cannot see any farther. Well, if indeed that was the case, look at our scale now. Remember, our Milky Way is one foot in diameter. Other clusters of galaxies are maybe hundreds of feet away from us. The universe would be 26 miles in radius, covering much of Chicago and up to Arlington Heights, out to DeKalb, down to Joliet. It's a big universe, isn't it? Really mind-boggling that that's how far we could see from our one-foot Milky Way. So is that how big the universe really is? Well, sort of. I keep saying that's how much we can see, but is that really how much the size of the universe is today? The answer is no. Why not? Well, because the universe has been expanding during that 13.7 billion years. So we can now calculate that the radius of the universe is actually 46 billion light years. You see that visible universe there at the center now, and much larger is what it really is. Can we see any of that? No. Why not? because we have not had enough time for the light from those regions to reach us. It is still traveling. We can only see this far. But I'd say again, that's a pretty big universe, 46 billion light years in radius. So let's do one more scale. Here was our 26 mile scale model of the universe. Here now, is how big it really is, 87 miles from the point I chose here, College of DuPage, up to Milwaukee, out to the Mississippi River, down towards Bloomington, over to South Bend, Indiana. That is an enormous, enormous universe that we live in. Well, I hope that'll give you something to think about, but let's move on and finish with one final piece to this puzzle. Is there anything beyond that? The answer is there may well be. We can't see it, of course, but here's the point. Space can expand faster than the speed of light. Now, maybe you've heard, well, nothing goes faster than the speed of light. 
That's true inside our universe. No material object can travel faster than light inside our universe, but there is no prohibition on the universe expanding faster than light. The second part of our answer here has to do with the fact that the universe has been shown to be geometrically flat, and I won't have time to go off into that discussion, but just for now assume that it's not curved in some manner. By knowing those two facts, and a few other things, astronomers can deduce that the entire universe may well be at least 250 times larger than the visible universe. So if I haven't uh, boggled your mind yet, I think maybe that finally did it. How big is that? Well, you take that 87 mile scale model we had here, multiply by 250, this means it could be 22,000 miles on our scale model. Just completely incomprehensible. I tried to make a diagram here on my slide, but when I did the, uh, the calculations, it came out to over 24 feet in radius, just not going to fit. So I think we've at least given a relatively good answer to how big the universe is. It's really, really big, isn't it? Let's change tracks now and go back and talk about the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang. By now, you probably know that theory has been uh, well established, well accepted, and well proven for many years, but I'd like to share with you three lines of evidence for the Big Bang. Number one, we've already considered the expansion of the universe. I'll just touch on that briefly. But number two, I'm going to discuss then more about that cosmic microwave background, sometimes called the leftover radiation from the Big Bang. I'll explain that a bit. And then something that might not be maybe so familiar is the abundance of helium in our universe. What would that have to do with it? Let me explain. First of all, we again established the expansion of the universe. We observe galaxies light is red shifted, which means that they are receding away from us. If we essentially go backwards in time, the galaxies were closer together yesterday, last year, last century, a million years ago, 10 billion years ago, they were closer together. And if you wind that all the way backwards, you will find, of course, they were all at one place, one point, essentially, what we call the Big Bang. So this one's pretty straightforward, I think. And again, we established that going all the way back to Edwin Hubble's work. Others have, again, made a much better estimate of that age we talked about. But the expansion of the universe is observational evidence for a Big Bang. Let's talk a little bit more then about that cosmic microwave background. Let me explain a little bit here. I've got a lot to talk about. First of all, picture the early universe, much smaller, much hotter and denser conditions. All of the matter and energy compressed into a smaller volume. You go back far enough to only a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, stable atoms did not even exist. We basically had free protons, free electrons, and free particles of light, photons, all in the universe, but it was too hot until the universe. As you see here in my diagram, the green regions, it's, it's early in the universe, it's too hot, but as it expands, the density and temperature drop. Now, protons can capture electrons and form neutral atoms at the mark 380,000 years. We call this recombination, okay? So what? <laughs> well, notice in the upper left of the little green region, a squiggly little photon coming in, and notice how the little photon bounces off the various particles. Can't get a straight line. We call that scattering. And so for the first 380,000 years of the universe history, photons were scattered. They could not travel in a straight line very far. Essentially, the entire universe would have been like an extremely thick, dense, opaque, cloud. You wouldn't be able to see anything. Light was completely scattered. Well, you can see at the breaking point there, when we move to the yellow region, when the protons captured the electrons, now the photons could travel through space unimpeded in nice straight lines. And as these photons were released, essentially filling the universe, they could travel freely. The universe became transparent. And essentially, these are the photons we see today filling the universe as the cosmic microwave background light. 
So think about what that means for a moment. These are very ancient photons. From the very beginning, they were created out of the energy of the Big Bang. They finally are free. The universe becomes transparent. And this, if you think about it, is then evidence of a Big Bang. In other words, this would have occurred because the universe was small and hot and dense. If the universe was infinite and eternal and never changing, this would not occur. We would not have a cosmic microwave background of light that we see. Well, we can look at that light a bit further, examine it, analyze it a bit. We can literally measure its energy, which is equivalent to measuring its wavelength. And interestingly, we can calculate that the expansion of space has stretched those light waves over 1,100 times their original wavelength. They started out as very high energy, very short wavelength, but they've been stretched out so greatly, they are now microwave wavelength, which is actually longer wavelength than visible light that you and I are used to. So the wavelength, as you see here, peaks at about one millimeter. And if we use one of the other laws of physics that my students have learned about lately, we can determine a temperature, 2.73 degrees Kelvin. What does that mean? Well, it means that empty space is not quite, not quite absolute zero. There is a very tiny, very tiny temperature, very slight amount of residual energy from the Big Bang. So once again, if the universe was eternal and unchanging, we would not see this. This then is also observational evidence of an extremely hot early universe. So you can see why the cosmic microwave background is very important in the study of the universe. Astronomers have to make sure that they take time and energy to understand it carefully, analyze it. It's obviously far more complex than I can get into tonight. I will tell you that there have been three distinct uh, satellite missions flown to give us the best possible measurements of this. One back in the 1990s, one in the early 2000s, and one oh, about eight years or so ago, continuing to give us better and better uh, looks at that cosmic microwave background. So let's take one more look at it here and again, we see these different colors. Let me talk about those for a minute, this all sky picture. Essentially, this is color coded to show us very slight temperature differences. Blue would be your very coldest, then you're into the green, and then the yellow, and then the red. Now still, these are very, very slight, only a few parts in a thousand different, but they do show something very intriguing to astronomers that these are showing the very earliest structure in the universe. In other words, the universe was not completely uniform in temperature. Well, that's interesting, but what does that mean for us as far as structure? These temperature deviations correspond to density deviations, a very slight increase in density in these regions. And this then would be, as is sometimes called, the seeds where gravity could begin to draw matter together into denser regions and eventually build stars, galaxies, clusters of galaxies. So this is kind of a profound picture to think about. We're seeing back as far as possible to the earliest stage of the universe and we see the very earliest, the very earliest structure in the universe. Again, very much like maybe dig in as deep as possible into the various layers of the earth to go back in time as far as possible. This is a pretty important and profound image, the cosmic microwave background. Let's move on to our third line of evidence for the Big Bang. Again, we go back and envision a very hot early universe. Now let me go back even farther. We're not going to just go back to 380,000 years after the Big Bang. We're going to go back to the first three minutes. Why that? Because when in those first three minutes, when the universe was so much smaller and so much hotter and denser, the temperature of the entire universe was millions of degrees. That's how much energy was in this very small universe. Well, that number implies that the particles had so much energy, they were moving so fast, as you can see here, that fusion could occur. 
students have learned all about fusion in the center of stars, you need temperatures of at least 15 million degrees for fusion to occur. And this implies then that again, that the universe had to be at least this hot for this to occur. If you're interested, you can look up to the top diagram there and you can see the, the chain reaction, how a proton and neutron fuse together to form deuterium. Those can fuse to make hydrogen three and then those can fuse to make helium a different element. So here's our point. During the first three minutes, the temperature was hot enough for this to occur. If we look at our Big Bang Theory, it predicts there should be approximately 75% hydrogen in our universe today, approximately 25% helium. That is what we find. Again, if the universe were infinitely old, we would not see this. In the lower right, you get a little sense here again of the atomic masses of each of them. If you started out with the right number of protons and some were fused into helium, notice the ratios. Look at the very bottom, the atomic mass, you'd still have 12, but over with helium, you'd have atomic mass of four, a ratio of three to one. Just as we said, 75% hydrogen, 25% helium. So I think you can see how this as well is a very good way to show that there had to have been an extremely hot early universe to produce this much helium. Even though stars fuse hydrogen into helium, they've only accounted for a few percent at most, a few percent of the helium in the universe. Nearly all of it was made earlier, shortly after the Big Bang. So I hope you can see those three main lines of evidence. There is one other one I thought I might share just quickly. It's kind of interesting. It's a little less technical, a little less technical. Go outside some clear night, look up at the dark sky. Think about the Big Bang. And consider this, if the universe were infinite in size, if it were unchanging in time, and if it were everywhere the same, every direction you look, you'd see a star. Some farther than others, but sooner or later, your line of sight would find a star. So what does that mean? It means that the night sky is dark because the universe had a beginning. It is not infinite in size and it is not unchanging over infinite time. We're looking back farther and farther. Now, of course, you could do this with your eyes. We could do it with powerful telescopes and the farther out we look, eventually we will see to a region where there are no stars. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, the light is really there. It's just red shifted, that's true. But that in itself is proof, is it not? In other words, if we can only look out so far before the light is so greatly redshifted, the redshift itself goes back to our first line of evidence to establish the Big Bang. So the next time you get a chance to go out and look at the night sky right now, maybe you've seen Jupiter and Saturn and Mars out there, think about the beginning of the universe. Well, let's consider two other major pieces of our universe, so to speak. Dark matter will begin with and let me begin at the top here. You see this friendly looking lady. Her name is Vera Rubin. I had a pleasure of meeting her once years ago. Vera Rubin played a very important role in our discovery of dark matter. Notice the graph on the right. This is a simple version of what she originally did in her work in the late 1970s. We see a picture of a galaxy and probably no galaxies are rotating. And the point being that of course, different stars at different distances from the center would rotate at a different velocity. Now, picture our solar system for just a moment. You'd probably know that the farther out the planets are, the slower they orbit. And that's really because most of the matter in our solar system is in the sun. And it's just the way the law of gravity works. It gets weaker with distance. And so the planets orbit slower. We, would, might, we might expect something very similar with a galaxy. The farther out you go, the slower it would rotate. In fact, notice that expected yellow curve there, after an initial increase, the farther out you go, the slower the stars should orbit around. Well, Vera Rubin's found something very different. She found that green line for our Milky Way and later other galaxies. So what does all this mean? It means that the outer regions of the Milky Way are rotating faster than we might expect 
if all of the matter was in the center. In, in other words, they rotate so fast, they should fly apart. Well, the Milky Way is not flying apart. But what that all really means when we add it up is that there's not enough gravity from what we see to hold the Milky Way together. You see where I'm going there? So these rotation curves are very, very fundamental and very, very important in understanding dark matter. The outer regions of the Milky Way are rotating faster than they should if we see everything. Since they're rotating faster, that implies we don't see everything. Well, of course, in succeeding years, astronomers have looked elsewhere. As you can see here, our line of evidence number two, the motions of clusters of galaxies. Now picture, as you see on the left here, a cluster with numerous galaxies. We find when we measure their motions, they're also very high. In other words, very fast motions, fast enough that they should be flying out of that cluster unless something's holding them in. Well, that something would be gravity, but the point is there's not enough visible matter, not enough gravity from visible matter to hold them in. Well, we can work that problem backwards and figure out, well, how much matter would there need to be to hold them in? You see the result on the right-hand image. We would need far more dark matter that we cannot see. Its gravity would hold them in. So in other words, this is indirect way to essentially detect dark matter. We don't see it, but we can work that problem backwards and figure out what it would take for that to be the case. So the fact that these galaxies are moving so fast tells us there must be mass that we simply can't see to hold it together. I have one more line of evidence I'd like to present to you on dark matter. It's called gravitational lensing. Maybe you've heard of that. Notice in our image, we see a group here of yellowish galaxies, a cluster of some very massive ones. Notice too around the periphery are some blue streaks of light. Now these blue streaks are not physical objects, as much as they may look like it. Instead, they are the distorted image of galaxies behind the yellow cluster of galaxies. What's going on here? Look over in our right-hand image. Picture us down here on Earth. You have that cluster of galaxies. If there's one or more galaxies in the distance behind the yellow cluster of galaxies, the light from those distant galaxies is bent or curved when it encounters the gravity of the cluster. Now to you and me, it looks as if the light is coming from a straight line off to the sides when really it has been bent from behind the cluster. Well, what's bending light? Einstein's theory of relativity tells us that gravity bends light and gravity of course comes from matter. So when we again add up what appears to be all the matter in that cluster, it is insufficient to account for this bending. In other words, there should be more mass there, more matter than we can see to account for the bending. Light traveling is bent through that, and the amount of the bending tells us how much mass there should be. It is far more than we can see in visible light. So here's yet another example of evidence, observational evidence to establish the existence of dark matter. So dark matter has proven to be very difficult to kind of get our hands on. You might know we've been doing experiments now for some time right out here at Fermilab and other places. And it's been very difficult to put our finger right on what it is. We've narrowed it down, we've constrained it, and we're hopeful that in the next few years we may have a breakthrough. It's very difficult because it doesn't emit any kind of light. And I don't just mean visible light, I mean any type, infrared, ultraviolet, radio light, doesn't emit any kind of light that we can see. All we really have to work with is its gravity. But what we have found is that based on our measurements of its gravity, there's far more of it, that dark matter than visible matter, several times as much. Well, this immediately raises very profound implications as well that dark matter then would be the main gravitational force in the universe. Take that even further. That means it was the main gravitational force in the formation of galaxies. Years ago, we started out coming up with early models of galaxy formation. 
got to tell you, they didn't work so good until we began to include dark matter. So this is obviously hugely important. And since the beginning of the universe, of course, then dark matter, again, would be the primary gravitational force driving the evolution of the universe, how galaxies change over time, how they clump together, we like to say. Dark matter would have the primary role here. So really, sometimes it's been likened to the tip of the iceberg. You've probably heard that many times. We can only see part of the ice above the water, much of it below, most of it below. Something similar going on here. Let's finish up with dark energy. How did we discover dark energy? Well, it began, as often happens in science, with a question. And this is a pretty profound question, as you can see in the bottom left there. What is the fate of the universe? How will it end up? Where's it going? What's it going to do? We know it's expanding. But some years ago, there were three main models of how it might expand. In other words, will it expand but slow down and then perhaps contract? back down to a point, recollapsing, we might have called that. Or could it begin, could it be expanding and slowing down its expansion, but never stopping its expansion? Or choice C, is it just a steady expansion? How could you tell? Well, back in the 1990s, as you see here, two teams decided to measure the expansion rate of the universe, but their point was this, think about this for a moment, they wanted to measure it at different points in time. Let's measure it today, let's measure it out at this particular point in time. This, how would you do that? You would measure it at different points in the universe, wouldn't you? If you measured here locally, that's today's expansion. If you measured it at a distance of, let's pick, well, let's just pick one billion light years in distance. You're looking back a billion years ago. What was the rate? Let's go out maybe five billion light years. What was the expansion rate there? Let's go back 8 billion light years. What was the expansion rate? Was the expansion rate steady or was it slowing down? There were kind of some equal bets going on here because of all of the matter in the universe. It was felt that the universe expansion should be slowing down. They kind of went into it almost kind of expecting that, but were they in for a shock? Instead, they found none of the three matched their results they found the expansion was accelerating. Here you see three of the lead scientists in those teams, Saul Perlmutter, Brian Schmidt, and Adam Reese. These three gentlemen received the Nobel Prize for this discovery is how big this was. So let me take a minute and describe how they found this. Gotta tell you, it's, it's almost funny how they said later, you know, we really didn't like this discovery. We almost didn't want this discovery, but it wouldn't go away. And for 20 years, it's not gone away. All right, how did they measure the expansion rate? Well, they needed to be able to measure distances accurately. And without going into a long discussion, they used what are known as supernovae, stars that explode. And these particular version of the supernova, when they explode, they explode with a certain specific, relatively constant luminosity. If we know the luminosity well, which we do, and we see one explode, again, we can compare the luminosity to the brightness and get the distance. Then we could also, of course, take its spectrum and measure its redshifts, could we not? So let's see exactly how they did this and essentially plot out some of their results. So the type one supernovae, they would measure the distance and they would do that at different points in time to show the velocity of the expansion of the universe. How fast was it expanding at that point, this point, this point? They found that the supernova were at greater distances than for a steady expansion. This of course means a greater distance in the same amount of time equates to a faster velocity. Let's take a quick look at our diagram here. In red, you see that first option of a recollapsing universe. First of all, it wouldn't have begun until only 4 billion years ago. That doesn't seem very likely. The green line corresponds to what we call the critical universe, where again, it is slowing down, but it always continues expanding. And the blue line is what many people expected to find, a coasting universe or a nice steady expansion. That's really what we see in our local universe out to maybe hundreds of millions or maybe a, a billion light years. 
but notice where their measurements lie. Notice where the black dots were. Sure, today they all lie very close together, the three models, don't they? But notice how the dots stray from the blue line the farther back you go. And that required them to add that fourth line, the accelerating universe, to fit the data. And as you know, science is based on, again, fitting the data to what we've measured. So this was a big shock to the entire astronomical community. I can tell you I was <laughs> shocked and we all were puzzled. How can this be? What's causing this, of course? We never imagined such a thing, but simply put, the acceleration or the expansion of the universe is accelerating. So what is causing it? Well, we don't know. We've got some ideas, but as I say sometimes, this is why we do science. We make a discovery of something we don't understand, and then the fun part begins to try to explain it. For now, dark energy is just a label for some type of energy, some repulsive force. There's been, again, a number of ideas about, well, I won't go into them right now, <laughs> but obviously a lot of work being done to understand dark energy. There is other evidence. I'll just finish up briefly. I won't get into great detail here in case you'd like to do any further research. If you go back to that cosmic microwave background, the size of the fluctuations that we talked about matches a flat universe, but there's not enough matter, both visible and dark matter, to make the universe flat until we add dark energy in. Dark energy counts when you consider the universe budget of mass plus energy. We have to add that in to match what we see the universe to be today. We've got two other lines here, the large scale stru structure of the universe. In other words, when we look at galaxy clusters, it makes sense that dark matter would be contracting them, pulling them together, concentrating them over time. But dark energy would be doing the opposite. It would be pushing outward, spreading them apart. What do we see? Well, when we map the universe, we find structure that does require dark energy. In other words, if there were no dark energy, the galaxies would be clumped much more together. But dark energy has balanced that out. And even the galaxy clusters themselves are more massive early in the universe than today. Why? Because their growth has slowed with dark energy again, spreading them apart. So other evidence for dark energy exists. And again, that's important for us to have confidence that we're on the right track there. Well, we've really considered a lot, haven't we? So let me just wrap up with a few thoughts here. You've seen how we've had to change our viewpoint, our understanding of the universe many times, but well, we're doing it right now as we speak. This is one of those times when our perspective, our understanding, our paradigm of the universe has changed. It's very much like when Copernicus published his model and people couldn't understand how it would be possible for the Earth to go around the sun when it didn't look that way. Well, that's a little bit of what the feeling we have right now. And so, you can see here, I've shared this quote before. I really have always appreciated what Isaac Newton said. He said, we're like children playing on the seashore, examining new and pretty seashells, while this whole great ocean of truth lies undiscovered before us. And I think that's a good statement. I think there's so much more to learn. We do not know everything about the universe. That's again, why we do science. And as I stated earlier, that's why it's an amazing universe and we're never gonna stop learning about it. Well, I hope you enjoyed our discussion. It's nice to have you with tonight. Before I wrap up, let me just let you know that if you enjoyed the discussion and you'd like to see a few more of these, we've recorded those in the past I've done. All you need to do is go out to YouTube and type my name in. You should be able to find my various astronomy presentations on a variety of topics you can see here. And also, I do also have two short courses in astronomy, a little more extended on the solar system and on stars and galaxies. So again, thank you for being with tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. And at this point, we'll pause and I'll turn it back over to Julie. Thank you, Joe, for a wonderful presentation. Um, as a reminder uh, for our attendees, if you have
question for Joe, uh, just please use that Q&A feature that you can find at the bottom of your screen. Our first question tonight is from Kim. I have heard the universe experienced a very brief but very rapid expansion called inflation at its very beginning. How does this fit into your discussion tonight? Well, that is a good question, Kim. I gotta tell you, I knew inflation would come up sooner or later. It's a big topic. We could spend a lot of time talking about that, but let me try to put it in a nutshell. Inflation basically states there was this incredibly rapid, incredibly short burst of expansion very early in the universe. I'm talking microseconds after the Big Bang. Now, why would scientists all of a sudden come up with such an idea? Well, because it explains several things we see in the universe. And sometimes we do that. We work a problem backwards and say, well, if this all explains it, it's possible it occurred. And we would want to, of course, try to prove that. But the point is this, when you go down to the very, very lowest levels of space, space is not quite perfectly smooth. It has very slight, what we call quantum ripples. And the idea here is if the universe started out very, very small, these quantum ripples would be greatly expanded by a burst of inflation. And these quantum ripples would be those seeds we see in the cosmic microwave background. So in other words, those seeds, those ripples, those small little regions may well be, have caused, been, been caused by inflation. That's probably the primary reason. There's others. The universe looks the same in all directions. Why is it like that? Why isn't one region of the universe different than another? Well, it's called isotropy. And the idea is that if the universe was very small and very homogeneous and then rapidly expanded, it would remain isotropic. So again, there's some reason to, to think that that may have happened. The final piece, we talked just only briefly that the universe has been shown to be geometrically flat. Why is it so perfectly flat? Why isn't it curved? Well, inflation explains that. Think of the surface of a balloon as a curved two-dimensional surface. If you expand that balloon rapidly, the surface feels flat, just like the surface of the Earth. And so again, that would account for um, the flatness if inflation did occur. Hope that answered your question. Another question, Julie? Let me check and see if we have any in our chat room here. And there's our Q&A. We have one from Amanda. If both space and time are expanding, carrying galaxies with it, and we've proven the acceleration is speeding up, does that mean time is speeding up? Well, now there's an interesting. Space and time expanding do not necessarily mean that time is going to speed up for us. The acceleration of the, of the universe, yes, is, is speeding up. The acceleration or the expansion being is going to be different than time um, speeding up. So we don't have to worry about that. We measured that very carefully. I um, hope that answers that question. But again, just because space and time are speeding up, so to speak, doesn't mean that um, it's going to affect us. Okay. And let's take one from Paula Coughlin here, a good friend of mine. Are there any other theories besides the Big Bang for the beginning of the universe? So that's a good one. Thank you, Paula. And I kind of thought we'd also get back a little bit more to that Big Bang. So you might even take that farther and say, you know, what, what, why the Big Bang? What caused the Big Bang, essentially? And the short answer is we don't know for sure. We're again at one of those stages where we have lots of thinking to do, lots of work to do, and it's going to take time. There are some hypotheses. One of them, one of them is that there was nothing before the Big Bang. It's not a real exciting answer, but it may well prove to be true. And the reason we say that is because the Big Bang was not only space, the beginning of space, but it was the beginning of time. Now that's pretty hard for us to understand and grasp. We think of time as being eternal, but that's not really what the theory says. And so it is possible, again, that the Big Bang was the beginning of space and time, and we simply would say there's nothing before the Big Bang. On the other hand, some have gone off and 
speculated and postulated that maybe there were other universes before us, or maybe our universe bounced from an old universe, or maybe, I would say it's very valid to speculate as long as you admit you're speculating and you admit that you don't have any evidence or proof. We don't want to put too much weight into those. So I hope that kind of answers your question a little bit. Um, as of today, there's no other solidly based theories other than the Big Bang, as you saw the evidence for it today. Decades ago, there was one where, again, the universe was eternal, but I think you saw the evidence why that really would not be the case. Okay, now let me get one from Janice, if I can get it there. On our expanding universe, is it expanding in an increasing or decreasing rate? So again, we saw that the measurements, and that's how we answer questions, the measurements show the expansion rate is increasing, if, if that is the question. And again, quite a surprise. Didn't really expect that. We still have yet to explain how that happens, why that happens, but they're hard at work on that, okay? Let me take another one here. Are the photons we see the same ones that were created during the Big Bang? And the short answer is yes. I think I alluded to that a little bit when we talked about cosmic microwave background. And the idea there is that photons were created at the beginning of the universe. They're early in the universe and they were sort of uh, constrained, so to speak, by matter early on. But once that recombination occurred, and photons were now free to travel. Yes, those are ancient photons from the beginning of the universe. So interesting question there. Let's see, I've got a couple here on life in the universe. Let me hold on to those for a minute and come back to that. Are there any prevailing theories about how we may one day detect dark matter and dark energy? Or are the definition undetectable and kind of a black box that we don't really understand. I think that's a good question. Part of the answer has to do with what you mean by the word detect. I think we probably have detected it. In other words, we sort of know it's there. But I'm thinking maybe the question is more about the understanding part. In other words, will we understand them? Right now, we found them both to be pretty difficult to understand. In other words, can, do we have an explanation? No. But let me invoke the precedent of past science. Go back 100 years, go back 200 years. People had no idea what we know today about the universe, the theory of relativity, quantum theory. All these things were almost inconceivable. And yet today, scientists accept them because they've been proven. So sometimes you have to say never say never. You know, it may be that there are going to be some things that are be extremely difficult to understand and may take a lot of time there may be other things that we finally do get that breakthrough that we've been looking for. In dark matter, they've been focused more on trying to determine it as a particular type of particle. I gotta tell you, they've eliminated a lot of possibilities, but the feeling is that in the next five to 10 years, if we don't find that particle, we may have to take a different approach. And again, that's the challenge of science, kind of the fun of it sometimes, but it can be very challenging to try to make a major change in your approach as far as dark energy, again, there are some ideas there um, that were thrown out very quickly. Um, down at the sub-microscopic level, at the quantum level, there are what are called virtual particles. And here's a, an example of something that you're gonna probably shake your head a little bit and not maybe accept just right away. You've probably heard of the law of conservation of energy. Well, these virtual particles can literally pop into existence from nothingness as long as they pop back out of existence quickly enough. Sounds like cheating, doesn't it? Well, there is observational evidence for this as well. Physicists can tell us this really happens. And the idea here would be that it's possible, we're not saying we've established this, but it is possible that if these little particles pop into existence, they give space-time a little bit of a stretch and then they pop back out of existence. And of course, this is happening trillions and trillions of times, and therefore space time itself is accelerating. So there's just one possible idea that may explain that. We'll have to wait and see where that goes. Well, I knew there'd be, again, a question about what happened before the Big Bang. I think I touched on it a little bit. We don't know, but we're at that stage where we are putting some ideas out on the table. And scientists, of course, are very good at uh, testing those ideas. 
And it's only that idea that remains after all the testing that continues to be accepted as a real theory. Okay. Let's see what else we got here. Boy, there's a lot of good ones here. Are new galaxies still forming? Well, yes and no. Most galaxies formed early in the universe. However, there's been such change in galaxies throughout the history of the universe that there are those right now that are undergoing bursts of star formation. So are they forming? Well, they're being dramatically changed. I'll, I'll put it that way. I don't know that any are necessarily forming from scratch at the moment. That occurred mainly early in the universe. He's got some good questions here. Let me go back up a little more to a few earlier ones. What is the center of the universe? Well, that's one of those questions that may just be hard to grasp, but there is really no center. We have to draw the universe in my diagrams as a sphere. And you and I are used to thinking of the center of a sphere, right? Everything's moving out around us. Well, that's our sphere. But let's say that you traveled, whatever, 10 million light years from Earth to another galaxy, you would also see everything moving out around you in a sphere. And that would be your sphere that you would be able to see and observe. And if you traveled another 50 million light years, the same thing would happen. So there really is no center. That is related to the question of where the Big Bang happened. And that's an interesting question because the answer is it happened everywhere. And that may seem odd to grasp. But again, picture the entire universe coming into existence, bursting into existence. The Big Bang occurred everywhere in space. That's why we can look in any direction and see um, the cosmic microwave background. Okay, so hopefully that answered that one. And let's see if there's anything else where we can take. We'll take a couple more here before we wrap up. We went just a bit over time, didn't we? Let's see here. Do you think humans will be able to travel at the speed of light? Well, I'm a Star Trek fan, I got to tell you, and they can do it. So. Again, never say never right now, that doesn't seem possible, but it seems as if there's always a breakthrough that enlarges our perspective, enlarges our perspective. And so again, who knows what'll happen? It may well be that we have bumped into an immovable barrier, but it may well be that we find a way around that. Again, go back in time to the 1930s, if you had asked aviation engineers, they probably would have agreed that we would never break the speed of sound, the sound barrier. Well, then it was done. So the point being that, again, we simply don't know. Um, I think it's possible, but it takes some very interesting physics, wouldn't it? All right. And finally, I guess I got to take this big one here that's been staring me in the face. Thoughts on life outside of Earth. There's several questions there. So let me touch on that. It wasn't really part of our lecture so much. But I'll just add a few comments and please understand these are just my thoughts. Other scientists may agree or disagree. First of all, um, I think life is extraordinarily special. I think we'd all agree about that. It's also extraordinarily complex. Now I'm speaking as a astronomer. I don't have a lot of background in biology to get into that. Often though you do hear well, there's millions of stars and there's millions of planets and there must be life on one of those planets. I think that's possible. But I've said this to my students before, the two are not necessarily um, a black and white thing. It is true that 50 years ago, we didn't even know about planets around other stars. Now we do. It is true that in the last oh, 10 years or so, we've been finding planets that appear to be relatively, relatively hospitable environment. You'll hear this term, the uh, habitable zone around a star where a planet might orbit and the temperature might be right for liquid water. Well, that's great, that's a first step, but my students in my solar system class are about to learn there's many more parts to this. There's many more things that have to take place. I won't go into great detail here, but there's many things that Take, did take place on Earth to enable life. And so my feeling is, while it is possible, we may find life on other planets, 
I think it's gonna be somewhat rare. I don't think it's gonna be as common as people think. My personal feeling is that, again, it's incredibly complex. I've always found it very difficult to accept that it began on its own um, because of the complexity. There's so much information in life. So again, there may well be life out there, um, but again, it may not be nearly as common as we might think. Okay, let's see if there's anything else that we can do here. I think I got most of the big topics. There's one final question. I think how far back can we see? I think we touched on that a little bit early in the lecture. We, that cosmic microwave background sure seems to be a impassable barrier, not because of our technology, but because of the beginning of the universe. Well, those were some good questions. So thank you very much for those. At this time, I'll just again say thanks very much for being with us. Hope you enjoyed that and hope you see you again in the future, whether in person or maybe in the spring, we'll need to, to do this again. But again, thanks for being here. This is Joe Del Santo. Have a nice evening.